Over the past year or so, uh, there's been a lot of requests and feedback from you all. And you want more on the issue of human sexuality. And so we thought that it would be a great thing to bring uh, somebody who's not a stranger to this house, who's, who's been at Grace Chapel several times over the years, um, to speak to us and to talk to us, to teach us quite literally to equip us on the issue of human sexuality. And I told our young adults on Friday night, and I said in the first service, and I'll say it again because the impact's been that great, but when I was 19 years old, I learned of Dr. Michael Brown, and I began to listen to some of his teachings and read articles over the years through Ask Dr. Brown on Facebook and his, his radio shows and his books, and he's been a great blessing to me, and I know today he will be a great blessing to you. Uh, he's a truth teller, he's full of the Holy Spirit, he walks in the Spirit, and would you help me welcome today to Grace Chapel, Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being here, seriously. Praise God. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's always wonderful to be here. I've, I've always had a great time ministering, spending time with the leaders, worshiping with you. And uh, as, as uh, Pastor Shane was talking about your generosity, you've been a blessing to our ministry as well, uh, special Jewish outreach projects your church has helped with and other things with our radio broadcast, so thanks, and uh, you get to share in the reward. Did I also get some of the hate mail? Can I send that to them as well? Do you get to share in that? Okay, uh, I, I wanna just uh, put my social media info up on the screen. If you wanna connect with us uh, on, on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, those are where we're, we're most active. So wherever you're active there, subscribe to the YouTube channel or get on Facebook. We, we were able to reach literally millions of people each week through our social media platforms, and, and each one's different, uh, but as soon as I write a new article, post a new video, we let you know on, on Facebook or Twitter, and then I'm normally writing about five articles a week, so whatever's going on in the world around you, you ever watch the news and get frustrated? Well, we're, I can be your voice. We, we get the message out, what you're feeling, we were able to convey, but I just wanna warn you in advance that if you share one of my posts, one of my articles, or one of our videos, I just wanna alert you, not everyone likes me. <laughs> I, 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 one guy reaches out to me on Facebook once, and I, happen, I just happened to spot the post, and he said, Dr. Brown, I, I'm thinking of, of pulling a, a link, I, I linked to one of your articles, but I've had like three people unfriend me and got some nasty comments, do you think I should pull the link? And I'm like, I got like 90 arrows in every part of my being from head to toe from getting attacked and you're wondering about it. Hey, listen, seriously, we have brothers and sisters around the world who literally have, have lost their heads rather than disobey Jesus. And we're worried about getting unfriended on Facebook. So seeing a dear brother here uh, who remembers the persecuted church in Romania, um, People have paid a price for the faith, so I'm never gonna be obnoxious, nasty, mean-spirited, but let, let's stand together. And, and if I say something, you agree with it, we help share the message, amen? Uh, just wanna mention a few resources that we, we brought with us that are, would be especially helpful, and then tell you what I did in the first service, which is a little bit different than this service, so you may actually wanna go back and, and, and watch or listen to the, the message from the first service, which is what I told everyone for the second as well. But uh, as we're speaking on uh, issues having to do with human sexuality and God's plan, this book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, you'll find really helpful. It will give you understanding of the struggles many go through and, and that, that say they're gay and Christian and how they, they read the Bible. It'll give you compassion, but then clear insight on what the scriptures actually say. And then this book, uh, Outlasting the Gay Revolution, this will deal with what's happening in the society around us, the trends, and then biblical principles that we can live by to help turn the tide. And uh, my most recent book uh, ties in with this, but it's also wider, it's called Has God Failed You? Finding Faith When You're Not Even Sure If God Is Real. This was written for the many who are losing their faith, struggling, 
in church right now, but wondering, is it really true? So many young people walking away from the Lord or walking away from church. So we, we deal compassionately with the real issues. But I have a couple of chapters in here that deals with the question, is the Bible outdated and bigoted? Does God hate gays, etc.? So you'll find those helpful. And if you get any two books, there's a debate we want to give you uh, with a famous rabbi, friend of mine, Rabbi Shmuley, as we debated. Uh, he asked for the topic, is, is homosexuality America's greatest moral crisis? So it's an Orthodox rabbi and I debating an issue from some different viewpoints. So the resources will be there right after the service. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll run down over to the book table and do a book signing there. Just gives me an opportunity to meet you. But let me just say this. Whenever I'm asked to speak on these subjects, and obviously there are many different things we address in our ministry, but whenever I'm asked to address these subjects, invariably there's a line of people wanting to talk to me afterwards. And many of them are in tears, and everyone has a relevant story. So even if nothing was happening in the society in terms of agenda and laws and court decisions and things in the schools that affect us and our families, just everyday life, this is nothing that, that we can avoid. So just now, in between services, signing books, there's a mom wanting to know, will this help her 15-year-old daughter dealing with her friends, you know, gay, trans, whatever. Uh, 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 another woman, older woman, saying, hey, my sister, her daughter just a few years ago came out as gay, told her on, on Mother's Day, I'm lesbian, and unless you accept me as is, we cut off the relationship. And then and what about attending a same-sex wedding? I was speaking on Long Island about a different subject, actually, and at the end of the night, we were doing Q&A, and we'll have Q&A just on this tonight, so please come out. It'll be eye-opening. If you differ with me on anything, if you want to probe, by all means, come and, and raise your questions. So uh, finish talking, and then people want to ask me questions about sexuality issues. One woman says, well, I, I, I teach in school, and in my school, unless we use the, the gender pronouns that the student chooses, so if a boy identifies one day as a girl, then you must refer to, to him as her and she, etc. I have to do this. If not, I lose my job. Then another woman says, well, well what do I do? I'm, I'm a medical doctor in the emergency room, and they tell us we have to follow how people identify when we fill out their medical forms, but that could be dangerous because men and women, there's different medication or a stroke, a man could respond one way, a woman another. There was actually a case where what was thought to be an obese man was rushed into the hospital having stomach pains. By the time they figured out it was actually a woman who identified as a man who was losing her baby, they lost the baby. What do they do? I'm invited to a same-sex wedding. Should I go? And the questions are everywhere. This is the world in which we live. And even if we weren't dealing with social issues as as shepherds of the flock, we have to care for the needs of the flock. And we're going to open the scripture, going to share some things with great love, but they'll be jarring. But it's, it's love that compels me. I was speaking in Ohio, a number of messages, but the church asked me, could I take one night and address, can you be gay and Christian? Did that, went through the scripture, the end of the night, line of people wanted to talk to me, and there's one couple crying. Mom is crying, father's crying. What's going on? Our daughter's 16, she came out as gay. We don't know what to do. I said, well, where is she? They said, well, we're with her uncle. I said, why? They said, well, we kicked her out. I said, you did what? They said, well, we kicked her out. I said, you go get that girl. You bring her back, that's your daughter. I said, you know how difficult that must have been for her to come out and tell you this? And she did it in the only language she has. She didn't say, well, I'm struggling with same-sex attraction. You know, she just, that's the way she's gonna talk. She's a teenager, that's, that's normal. And I said, you get her back in your house, sit her down, say, look, you know what we believe, but you're our daughter, and we love you, period. And, and, but how do you respond, and what's the right thing to do, and what's the wrong thing to do? And so this is life in the year 2021 in America, how are we, as the church, going to respond? So turn with me to, to Romans, the first chapter. Romans, the first chapter. And as Paul is speaking there, he's, 
he's talking about how God's wrath is being revealed and how all human beings, Jew and Gentile alike, come under God's judgment because of our sin. And, and he says in verse 20, for since the creation of, of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Where have you read before about people and birds and animals and reptiles? Sounds like Genesis 1, the creation account. And what Paul is saying is that the human race, he's talking about the history of the human race, as the human race rejected the revelation of God in nature, rejected what was obvious and, and fell into idolatry that they began to worship created things. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who's forever praised, amen. So he's saying because of our turning away from the one true God and worshiping idols that God gave us over to sexual sin. And if you want to talk about universal sins that the human race commits, they're sexual sins. I remember preaching in different parts of the world where the culture was so different and the people looked so different and everything sounded and seemed so different. And I'm about to get up and preach a repentance and holiness message and I... I asked the brother that was leading the meetings, I said, do the people sin here the same way as America? I said, yes, brother. There's adultery, there's murder, there's, they're human beings. So sexual sin. And because in the midst of this, rather than turn to God in repentance, we continue in our idolatry. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And then he goes on to list all types of human sin, including greed and envy and slander, and said this is the state of the human race. And what's interesting is in verses 26 and 27, even though most of our English translations say men and women, the Greek does not say men and women. It says males and females. Paul doesn't use those terms a lot. He uses them very specifically. There's neither male or female in Christ's meaning. There's no class distinction in the Messiah. Most of the time he talks about men and women. The reason he talks about males and females is he's bringing us back again to Genesis 1, God's order in creation. There are gay theologians that say, no, what Paul meant here is that he, he gave heterosexual men over to homosexuality and, and heterosexual women over to lesbianism, in other words, to do what was contrary to their own nature. But that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the, the function and nature as God intended it and made it. He's going back to Genesis 1 and saying, as a result of the sin of the human race, not talking about every individual, we were given over to idolatry. We were given over to sexual immorality. We were given over to other sexual desires contrary to God's intended order. And what happens is when we deviate from God's norm, everything gets out of whack. There was a tragic plane crash or actually plane shot down, Korean Airlines Flight 007 in the 1980s. It, it just veered a, a little bit off course. And, and, and when it took off slightly off course, somehow it kept getting off course, either a navigation error or a pilot error. It ended up over Russian airspace. When the pilots didn't respond, Russians shot them down. Several hundred people killed, including American congressmen. It, it just was slightly off, but it kept going. And where we find ourselves today is the result of a deviation that has been going on for years. Francis Schaeffer, in 1968, talking about gay activism. This is before Stonewall riots, 1969. This is before the sexual revolution had 
manifested itself fully in that way. And he talked about the inevitable outcome of this is, is the war on gender itself and war on gender distinctions themselves. Just got a news item from a friend yesterday that a middle school in, in Virginia is now removing the urinals from the boys' rooms, boys' bathrooms. Why? Because there are girls who identify as boys who are now allowed to use the boys' rooms, but they are offended by the presence of urinals. There are college campuses where in the ladies' room, excuse me, in the men's rooms, you can now get tampons because men menstruate also. This is some of the social madness that we've fallen into because we have deviated from the path. In 2004, God called me to begin addressing homosexual activism in our society. I began to see what was happening in the education system, in the business world, in the courts. Up until this point, if, if you looked at the first 20 books I wrote through, say, 2011, maybe you could get a page, pull out all the books, maybe one page where I dealt with gay, lesbian issues. It wasn't my focus. It wasn't a big thing I preached about. I constantly preached about sexual immorality. I'm a heterosexual. I understand issues of heterosexuality, sin, and, and, and all the junk that's out there, and adultery, and, and pornography. And I preach holiness, but, but gay, lesbian stuff was just not on my radar because it's not my own background. And I wasn't particularly burdened about that aspect of what was happening in society because there were a thousand other things that were burdening me and concerning me. But I felt this calling about the issues, the societal issues, and I talked about that in the first service, where things are going in our society. But then I knew if I was to have God's heart here, I couldn't just care about the issues, I had to care about the people. What about the hurting people? What about the kid that grows up in church and discovers at 12 years old, he's not attracted to girls, he's attracted to guys. So he prays and he can't tell anyone, he's embarrassed, he won't tell his parents, can't tell the youth pastor, prays and wrestles and tries to have demons cast out of him. What's the matter with me? And, and then finally he realizes, hey, God made me like this. I, he made me to be gay and the Bible's fine with it. And, you know, what about, what about having a heart for people? I find out from a family member not until he's in his late 60s. He's now transitioning to, to be a woman when I hear about it. And he says, you have no idea the pain I live with all these years. You have, you have no idea what I struggle with. God began to break my heart for the people. And the word he gave me was reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. So, so here's the challenge. If we talk about what's happening in the society, and we must, because it's the world in which we live, and you'll see in a moment our very rights and freedoms are being affected. If we address this, then we're gonna hurt people. We're gonna hurt struggling people. You're here and your, your grandkids, seven years old and struggling with gender identity, and you're like, I don't wanna hear about what's happening in society, I don't wanna hear, help, help my grandkid. So if we, if we talk about why same-sex marriage is not really marriage in God's sight and, and, and why the Supreme Court decision was wrong, well, now we're hurting this gay couple. It's like, we love each other just like you love each other. On the other hand, if you just concentrate on ministering to the people with love and compassion, but don't address the issues because you don't want to hurt anybody, before you know it, we've all been put in the closet. So we live with a certain holy tension. And... Anytime I speak on this, I, I'm speaking to both. I'm sounding the alarm about the issues in our society while thinking about a 15-year-old kid that came into the service struggling with suicide and depression because of these the sexual identity issues, wondering is there any hope for him in the church. And when we carry God's heart, we have that holy tension. But I just want to take a moment before we focus on the people, before we focus on reach out to the people, and, and look, the Equality Act is being pushed in Congress right now. The, the Biden administration is very much behind this. If the Equality Act becomes law, this is what it'll do. It'll force churches, mosques, and synagogues to either promote LGBT activities or face devastating court fees and bankruptcy. 
If, for example, any, any building here in your facility is used to perform marriages, then any gay couple could come in and demand that the church perform a marriage for them. And if you refused, you'd be breaking the law. Destroy gender privacy in every bathroom, locker room, and shower outside your private home. Force all Christian organizations, businesses, and schools to hire transgenders. So a 50-year-old biological male, very clearly a male, comes to your Christian preschool, says, I'd, I'd like to be a teacher in your preschool. He's wearing a dress, identifies as Sally. If he's otherwise qualified, you would be required to hire him in your Christian school or your school could be shut down. This is, not, this is reality, friends. And I've had friends of mine who've lost their jobs, literally lost their jobs because of their privately held views on, on biblical sexuality. If the Equality Act becomes law, it would silence those wanting to be freed from same-sex attractions or behavior. This could even lead to banning portions of the Bible because it offers the, the power to free people desiring to change or overcome unwanted LGBTQ attractions or behavior, enact many other bigoted directives that would effectively criminalize Christianity in America, and there are zero religious exemptions in the bill. It specifically says there are no religious exemptions. Doesn't matter if your state has a strong religious Freedom Restoration Act, doesn't matter. No religious exemptions. And a lot of this has been happening. In the first service, I talked about things I wrote 10 years ago and was talking about 15 years ago. So this is what's happening next. We just want you to know, this is what's coming, and now it's happened. So none of this is a surprise on any level. And we've been talking about, for years and years and years, what kids are being taught in schools. There was a young lady who was in our school of ministry over a decade ago. She was teaching at one of the best preschools in Charlotte, North Carolina. She was not allowed to say, boys, be quiet, because that was making a gender distinction. She couldn't say boys and girls. She had to just say friends and talk generically. She was required to read kids' books like Heather Had Two Mommies and things. Ultimately, she resigned the job. This was over a decade ago in Charlotte. Just check out this enthusiastic preschool. Preschool, you're dropping your kids off. Four-year-olds. Listen to her excitement as she shares some of the agenda. Story time. This has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own, teaching alongside another queer neurodivergent educator, and we have been rocking our twos class. We've been talking about gender and skin color and consent and empathy and our bodies and autonomy. It's been fabulous. But our teaching team is shifting and a new person is being onboarded, someone with many years of experience. So today at the lunch table, when the topic of gender and genitals came up, one of our students plainly looked up and said, well, I'm a girl today, but I know that teacher Ko isn't. No, they're Envy. And the look on the incoming teacher's face was priceless. She was shocked in a good way. And she just looked around at the two of us and said, this class is incredible. And I am so impressed. That's what you call child abuse, friends. And notice the passion behind it. Notice how in this young lady's view, this is a wonderful thing to do. And if you didn't catch all of that, celebrating a little kid, I'm a girl today, so you can be a girl one day, but that's however you feel, you could be neither. And teacher Cole referred to as they, not he, she, they, or NB, non-binary. What, what does that mean to a four-year-old? Nothing, but you are raised in this and indoctrinated in this and things shift. Why do you think suddenly Gallup polls surveying people for many years and all generations of Americans, suddenly there is this massive spike in Generation Z, this massive spike in young people identifying as bisexual. And suddenly numbers rising, identifying as transgender. How did that just happen? You get raised in this environment, from children's cartoons to comic books. Some years back, probably about a decade ago, I wrote an article on mutant as a code word for gay in the X-Men movies. That there was this clear message throughout and that it was to sensitize you to, to gay, lesbian, activist causes and things like that. So accepting the mutants as, as just uniquely gifted people who are different. 
So I, I wrote an article about it, and I got blasted on gay websites. You know why? I said, who didn't know this? What, you think this is news? We've known this for years and years, and it's been in the comic books for years. You're just learning this now? How stupid. So this has been out. These things have been pushed for years. In 2004, I realized that LGBT activism, and the, the, the T part was not as prominent then, Already in 2004, I realized this was the principal threat to freedom of religion, speech, and conscience in America. 17 years ago. At the same time, we're talking about people. And I want to focus the rest of this talk with you on this, the first part of the commission I got, which was reach out to the people. And look at what's written in Romans 13.10. We read from Romans 1. What's written in Romans 13, 10? Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And this is a verse that gay activists have used very powerfully, especially those who say they're gay Christians. Because they say, look, this whole idea that the only right relationships are heterosexual relationships, it was so painful because that means, well, I've got to be single. I've got to change from, from gay to straight. just have to change the way I feel. And, and it was depressing. And I'd read the Bible, and I'd feel like God was angry with me. And, and there's something wrong with me. And then I realized, and this is how he made me, that, that the Bible is against, not against loving gay relationships. The Bible is, is against promiscuity and, and, and pederasty and, and prostitution and that's, that's the issue and same-sex acts in the context of an idolatrous temple but loving, committed, monogamous, same-sex relationships, he's fine with The moment I heard that, I, I thrived, my, my whole life changed, I've been happy and satisfied now. And One well-known Catholic scholar, New Testament scholar, brilliant scholar, he held to what the Bible clearly teaches about human sexuality and said, yeah, the Bible is clear on it. Actually, it's clear. However, I watched what happened to my daughter. I, I watched her once we accepted her as a lesbian Christian and accepted her partner, how she, her whole life has changed and how happy she is and how thriving she is. I was talking to, to one gentleman. He had been married, oh, I think 37 years. Kids, grandkids but living with this inner torment that he was really a woman and finally came out, I'm actually a woman, began to dress as a woman, went on hormones, I don't know how far he went with sex change surgery. And I said, what happened to your marriage? He said, it effectively destroyed my marriage and rendered my wife a widow and has alienated my children. I said to him, but you're called to lay down your life for your wife. No matter how painful it is, you gotta lay down your life for your wife, that's the husband's role. And he says, it was either sex change or suicide. Love does no harm to its neighbor. So you just have to accept these things, embrace them. And that's what we're told. And, and I was just talking to people during the book sign and they said, yeah, we know a number of people and each of them, when their kid came out as gay, they changed their theology. They changed their viewpoint. I was talking to a Methodist pastor on my radio show, and he had been defrocked by the church. They ended up reinstating him, but he had been defrocked when he performed the, the wedding for his son and his son's partner, and he thought it was a loving thing to do. He was shocked. He was shocked that he got defrocked. So I asked him a question. I said, your views have changed now. He said, yeah, as I've studied scripture and thought about things and watched my, yeah, my, my views have changed. I said, what if your son came to you and said, dad, I, I've made a terrible mistake. God does not want me in this relationship. He does not want me that, uh, it's wrong, it's, I know it's sinful, I shouldn't be in a same-sex relationship. I said, would that cause you to rethink your theology? He said, absolutely. I said, that's your whole problem, man. I mean, on the one hand, it's loving, but the ultimate love has to be love for God and love for God's ways and knowing that God's ways are best. And when we deviate from them, we have the madness that we see in the society today or the madness of that video or some other clips I played Friday night and, and Sunday morning, the first service. When we deviate from the path, ultimately it will hurt far more than it helps. 
And I said to him, Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me, whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So let's, let's come at this from another angle and ask about love does no harm. As we have reality TV shows that many of your kids watch for years, jazz, go through the whole sex change procedure and, and celebrate anything trans. Athletes now, men competing against women. We celebrate that, isn't that wonderful? Think what, what's, hap what's happened to our world? What's happened to our thinking? There's an outcry now. You don't use the word breastfeed anymore because that offends transgender men who are breastfeeding. So transgender, how does that work? Because it's a woman who identifies as a man. So Scott Nugent, I read a very bold column months ago published in Newsweek. Scott's originally Kelly. Scott is a she. Female to male. Transgender. Terrible health issues right now because of the surgeries and the hormones and everything. Took two years. We actually talked by phone, had a long talk by phone. Two years for her to get this published in any major publication. That's how much resistance there was. And Newsweek, to their credit, published it. Just look up Scott Nugent Newsweek. It's, it's a shocking article. And she lists all of the issues, and she says, look, what adults, they can do what they do, but we must stop this with the children. We must stop putting children on hormone blockers. We must stop exposing them to these things. So she writes this and documents each point. Higher suicide rates when, you, when sex change surgery, what do you end up with? Higher suicide rates than non-trans population. 12% higher chance than non-trans population to develop symptoms of psychosis. Chance of stunted brain development. Much reduced chance for lifelong sexual pleasure. Higher chance of sterility and infertility. No improved mental health outcomes. Not completely reversible. Decreased life expectancy. Increased risk of premature death from heart attacks and pulmonary embolisms. Bone damage. Possible limb damage. Increased mental health complications. Increased chances of mood syndrome symptoms. And the reason we talked by phone was because she ended the, the article by saying, I will work across the aisle. Evangelical, atheist, Republican, Democrat, whoever. I will work across that. We must stop the assault on children. Because this is where it goes. This is where it ends up, friends. So I wrote an article commending this and commending the courage. And, and Scott, as I knew the name then, reached out and said, let's talk. And, and working tirelessly at great personal sacrifice to try to wake up America. There's a book written by Abigail Schreier called Ir Irreparable Damage about what's happening, especially with, with teen girls who are identifying as boys having sex change surgery only a few years later to say, what in the world did I do? Comes out from Regnery Press, the, the number one conservative publisher in America, Amazon would not allow them to advertise. They, they allow them to sell the book, but they do not allow them to advertise it. They ban them from advertising on Amazon. Ryan Anderson wrote a book, When Harry Becomes Sally. He's PhD, brilliant guy, well-researched, compassionate book, bestseller, Amazon pulled it. They banned the book. You cannot buy it on Amazon. This is, this is how far the agenda has gone. And who's getting hurt and destroyed? Children. Look at this firsthand account from a young woman in England. She says, I look back, Kira Bell, her name is, I see how everything led me to conclude it would be best if I stopped becoming a woman. My thinking was that if I took hormones, I'd grow taller and wouldn't look much different from biological men. Because she grew up feeling like a tomboy and then realized I'm attracted to women, not to men, and all of this. I began seeing a psychologist through the National Health Service, or NHS, when I was 15, because I kept insisting that I wanted to be a boy, I was referred to the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock and Portman Clinic in London. There I was diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which is psychological distress because of a mismatch between your biological sex and your perceived gender identity. By the time I got to the Tavistock, I was adamant that I needed to transition. It was the kind of brash assertion that's typical of teenagers. Ever remember how you felt as a teen and kind of look back at it laughing, but it was so real then? It was so important then? Had to be? The, the good thing is you can't make lifelong decisions then, right? You don't have a driver's license. 
can't even vote, can't drink. But here you can make life-altering life -altering decisions with your physical body as a child. By the time I got to the Tavistock, I was adamant. It goes on. After a series of superficial conversations with social workers, I was put on puberty blockers at age 16. A year later, I was receiving testosterone shots. When 20, I had a double mastectomy. So it's my third time reading this, and I can't get through it. By then, I appeared to have a more masculine build, as well as a man's voice, a man's beard, and a man's name, Quincy, after Quincy Jones. But the further my transition went, the more I realized that I wasn't a man and never would be. We are told these days that when someone presents with gender dysphoria, this reflects a person's real or true self. The desire to change genders is set, but this was not the case for me. As I matured, I recognized that gender dysphoria was a symptom of my overall misery, not its cause. Five years later, beginning my medical transition to become male, I began the process of detransitioning. A lot of trans men talk about how you can't cry with a high dose of testosterone in your body, and this affected me too. I couldn't release my emotions. One of the first signs that I was becoming cured again was that, thankfully, at last, I was able to cry. I had a lot to cry about. The consequences of what happened to me have been profound. Possible infertility. Loss of my breasts and inability to breastfeed. Atrophied genitals. A permanently changed voice. Facial hair. When I was seen at the Tavistock Clinic, I had so many issues that I was, it was comforting to think that I really only had one that needed solving. I was a male in a female body, but it was the job of the professionals to consider all my comorbidities, not just to affirm my naive hope that everything could be solved with hormones and surgery. You know, not that long ago, there was one gender clinic in America where you bring your kid and they say, yeah, it's, they're trans, transgender, let's get them on hormone blockers. Now, now they're, they're hundreds. Children are basically human guinea pigs in a deadly experiment. Concerned parents, website parents of ROGD kids, we are a group of parents whose children have suddenly, seemingly out of the blue, decided that they identify strongly with the opposite sex and are at various stages and transitioning. This is a new phenomenon that has only recently been identified. Researchers are calling it rapid onset gender dysphoria. And it is epidemic among our most vulnerable youth. Our children are young, naive, and impressionable. Many of them are experiencing emotional or social difficulties. They're strongly influenced by their peers and by the media who are promoting the transgender lifestyle as popular, desirable, and the solution to all their problems. And they're being misled by authority figures such as teachers, doctors, and counselors who rush to affirm their chosen gender without ever questioning why. We are skeptical of the current standard of care, the affirmative approach which only seems to confirm and solidify our children's misguided, externally influenced sense of self. And we are horrified at the growing number of young people whose bodies have been disfigured, their physical and mental health destroyed by transitioning, only to discover too late that it did little to relieve their dysphoria. Please read our story, see the devastating impact ROGD has had on our children and families. This is now increasingly common with teen girls, who often as their bodies develop, feel uncomfortable in their bodies, or what's wrong with me, I don't look the way my friends look. And then some that are autistic as well may have more of these emotional adjustment issues, and now they're told, oh, you're actually trans, that's the whole problem. And you're having these kids at young ages, having sex change surgery, and, and then hormones in their bodies that, that you can't reverse long term, the, the effect, and it's a couple years later, and they think, what, what did I do? And, and you're thinking, what were the parents doing? And what about the medical profession? One of the top psychologists in America told me, oh, probably 10 years ago, that any of this is child abuse. Just watch this brief video, then I've got a few more things to share with you. Walt Heyer, who, whom I know loves the Lord, loves his wife, back to being a man, but went through hell and back, getting sex change surgery from head to toe, and he found that the website sexchangeregret.com, listen to his story. My name is Walt Heyer, and I used to be a transgender. In fact, I lived eight years as a transgender female. The reason I'm no longer a transgender is because I found the truth. And I found out uh, it took me a long time to discover the truth, but I started my journey of what they call transgenderism uh, at the age of four. 
and struggled with my gender identity for most of my life and uh, eventually got married uh, in my early 20s had two children. I was an executive for an automobile company. I worked on the Apollo space missions as a associate design engineer on cryogenic connectors and struggled still with my identity until I went to one of those people they call experts in gender identity. In fact, the guy I went to was the guy who authored the original Harry Benjamin International Standards of Care. So he was an expert. And so he diagnosed me with gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria and said the cure for your problems that started when you were four was hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgery. And so I went through the, the protocols and spent the two years between the time I was first diagnosed uh, wondering uh, if this was going to work. And eventually in April of 1983, I underwent gender reassignment surgery in Trinidad, Colorado. It was a few years after that, about five or six years after that, I began to study psychology and of addictions at uh, UC Santa Cruz and began to crack open the books and found out that uh, people who identify as a transgender are actually suffering from a variety of what they call comorbid disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and many other disorders that the people who are experts, like my doctor, was never paying any attention to. And it's, frankly speaking, from my point of view as a former young child who did this, it's child abuse and it shouldn't be done. Yeah, so of course his marriage is destroyed and, and then he gets born again. He goes into a church, this is the interesting thing, goes into a church as a woman and tells the pastor, this is who I am, and the pastor welcomes him. This is who I am, this is my story, born wall, now this, and the pastor welcomed him. This is what we have to do, is whoever comes in, whatever your state is, wherever you find yourself, you're gonna meet with love, and you're also gonna meet with truth. When he gets wonderfully born again, he realizes what he's done to destroy his life and family, and then begins to follow Jesus and gets undone whatever he can in his body and gets off the hormones and all of that. But he founded sexchangeregret.com and in his case, in his case, he's, his mother, his grandmother used to dress him up in a dress when he was like four years old and tell him how pretty he looked in the dress. So that was when he got affirmed. And then he got sexually abused by a male and this is what ended up where he is. Just real quick, Nathaniel, look at this. Less than a year after having gender surgery, Nathaniel now says the whole thing was a bad idea. I'm 19 years old, and I feel as though I've ruined my life. He said a, a month after his 18th birthday, Nathaniel had what's euphemistically called bottom surgery. For a male like Nathaniel, that means refashioning the male genitalia into a pseudo-vagina. He suffered some complications that required a second surgery a few months later, and he had facial surgery to further feminize his appearance. In his own words, now that I'm all healed from the surgeries, I regret them. 19, 19 years old. The result of the bottom surgery looks like a Frankenstein hack job at best, and that got me thinking critically about myself. I had turned myself into a plastic surgery facsimile of a woman, but I knew I still wasn't one. I became, and to an extent still feel, deeply depressed. There is a movement across the country of men and women who've come out of homosexuality, some of them with their desires heterosexual, some just with a lessening of homosexual desires, some simply saying no to them to live for Jesus. I know many of them myself. Just put a picture up of some. Some are ex-trans. I, I know some of these people. I know the transformation of their lives. I, I know that change is possible. And, and that's the message we need to proclaim because there is an attempt to stifle it and shut it down. The most famous psychologist who wrote books on the possibility of change through counseling was banned on Amazon a few years back. Can't get any of his books there. There's an attempt to shut this down. When you hear conversion therapy bill, that's the way they phrase it, to say it will be illegal to counsel. In many of our states, it's illegal to provide help for a child under 18, even with parental affirmation. If the child says, I have unwanted same-sex attractions, or I feel like I'm trapped in the wrong body, illegal to provide them with counsel. And California almost passed a bill to make it illegal for anyone of any age to get counsel and help. 
And that means that it breaks down to churches giving count. This is where it's going, to shut our voices down. If we really care about people, I'm gonna close here. If we really care about people, we've got to join grace and truth together. Yes, there's a crisis in the society. But right here in this room, and those watching online, every one of you has a story, either friend or loved one or coworker, real life situations we deal with. Let it be known that Grace Chapel is a place where people can come, whoever they are, whatever their background, meet with God and experience change. Meet with God and have hope for a better life. God did not make anyone to be gay or lesbian or trans. God has a better way. And because love does no harm to its neighbor, we, we, are, we are determined to show that better way. Amen? We are determined to show that better way. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, take these simple truths, drill them home into our hearts, and make us changers of lives through the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to run over to the book table to meet you there. Turn things back to Pastor Shane. Thank you. Can we thank Pastor Brown? Dr. Brown this morning. Amen. Uh, just a, a couple quick uh, notes for you this morning, and uh, so I don't forget. I want to make sure that you know that as a pastoral staff, as a staff here at Grace Chapel, we love and care for you deeply. And if any of this hits home in a way that we can help, we wanna be able to do that. So we have resources in our community and we have great resources right here in our church body. And we wanna be able to help you do that, amen? And so, uh, yeah, we need to let you know that. I want you also to know that uh, Dr. Brown's books will be available just past the fellowship hall in the GCA hallway. He'll also be able to uh, sign them there. And also tonight at 6.30 p.m., uh, Dr. Brown will be right back in this room uh, to field questions. That's all that we're gonna do tonight is field questions. And he made a statement at the beginning. If you disagree with anything he said, feel free to bring that in the form of a question and he'd love to have that conversation with you. Uh, he really means that when he says it. Now, I should also note that the second service message was a continuation of first service. So as first service tuned in to the second service, hopefully online, to get the continuation. It would behoove all of us in this room to go back and look at what he did in first service, and then we kind of end the story tonight in that question and answer time. Amen? Would you stand to your feet if you're able, and let's pray. I think it's a good, good way to end today. So, Father, I thank you. We thank you for your goodness and your overwhelming love. God, we want all men, all women, to encounter you. And so, Father, one of the ways you do that is you use us as a conduit. So fill your church with your spirit to do the work of Jesus, to love boldly, to be full of grace, but God, to keep the truth. Empower your church today by your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you as you go. Have a great week. We'll see you very, very soon.